Good evening, Facebook friends and family, and YouTube friends and partners of our ministry, Faith Builders Church United Kingdom. I'm welcoming you to our church service again. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much, God, for this opportunity. We thank you, God, that this is the wonderful day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we thank you for another time where we can sit at your feet, where we can take nourishment from your word. Father, I pray for anointing like never before. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for the right viewing audience. I pray that everybody's needs will be met over and above. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that your people everywhere would have all sufficiency for all things and do abound to all good works. I pray for a rhema word, God. I pray you'll do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I can ask or think. Lord, have your way in this place. I pray that I will be controlled, guided, and led by the Holy Spirit. We bless you and we praise you and we give you honor and glory. In the wonderful, precious, and perfect name of Jesus of Nazareth, we have prayed. And the church said, Amen and Amen. Hello again. We will be getting into the word for today. If you don't have your Bibles, please run quickly, get your Bibles so you can follow along with me. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And God also says in four in Proverbs 4.20 that we should attend to the word of God. You're probably tired of hearing me saying this, but faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He says to attend to, you, to the word, incline thine ears unto thy sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them the midst, into the midst of their heart, for they are life and healing to all their flesh. So if you want a dose of healing, get it in through as many avenues as you can. Get it through your ears, through your eyes, and you will, um, God will perfect that which concerns you. So tonight I will be speaking on speak the word. We have to speak the word. You can see in Genesis, in chapter one, God did nothing without speaking first. He spoke the entire world into existence. And Hebrews 1.3 even tells us that he ups, upholds all things by the word of his power. So if his word fell apart, which is impossible because heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will never fail. So if, if he um, failed to uphold the world by his word, everything would crumble apart. And he wouldn't because he upholds all things by the word of his power. And life and death is in the power of the town. So words are powerful and we need to speak. Because in Genesis, before anything happened, Jesus spoke. He, in the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And God said, let there be light. So as um, we are not greater than our Lord, we have to speak. Jesus spoke, we have to speak. So let's go to Hebrews chapter one, verse three, and I'll be reading from the Amplified Version of the Bible. So if you can go quickly and get your Bible, if you're just joining us. Hebrews chapter one, verse three, we have Hebrews and then James. So it's just before James. Words are powerful. We can choose, we can speak life or death, but we need to choose life. God sets before us life and death, he sets before us life and death, blessing and cursing, and he commands us to choose life that we and our seed may live. So Hebrews chapter one, verse three. He is the sole expression of the glory of God. That's Jesus. The light being the outrearing or radiance of the divine. And he is the perfect imprint and very image of God's nature upholding and maintaining and guiding and propelling the universe by his mighty word of power. When he had offered himself, accomplished our cleansing of sins and riddance of guilt, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So God upholds all things by the word of his power. Jeremiah 1 12 tells us he watches over his word to perform it. Let's go quickly to Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 12. Jeremiah is one of the major prophets, Isaiah, and then we have Jeremiah. Jeremiah. 
Jeremiah 1 12. Then said the Lord to me, and when God is speaking, we have to listen. So God was speaking through the prophet Jeremiah. You have seen well, for I am alert. That's why we can't be in a drowsy, drunk state of mind. We need to be alert. The end times are coming. We're hearing rumors of wars. There's famine. There's pestilence. There's so many things going on that these are signs of the end time, perilous times. So he's saying to be alert and active. So he's saying, um, sorry, let me read. Then said the Lord to me, you have seen well for I am alert. We need to be alert and active. God is alert and active. We need to be alert and active, watching over my word to perform, to perform it. So let's go to Isaiah 55, 11, because it tells us that his word cannot return to him void. Isaiah is just before Jeremiah. So flip back a few pages. Isaiah 55, 11. We'll just back up a few uh, verses. Let's start from verse 7. But we're focusing on verse 11. Let the wicked forsake his way. So this is what God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah. And he again is a major prophet. So he's saying, let the wicked forsake his way. Because God's ways and his thoughts are higher than ours. And the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord. So if, if it's your Bible, you can underline that word return. It means they already belonged to the Lord before, but they departed because he says to return. So he had to be walking with the Lord before. They had to be walking with him before. Return to the Lord and he will have love. Wow. What the world needs now is love. And everyone's looking for love. Some people are looking for love in a rum bottle. Some people are looking for love in a man. They're looking for it in all the wrong places but everyone needs love we were created by god who is love and we love to be loved and accepted we don't like our rejection we were not made for rejection so he said let, let him return to the lord and he will have love pity mercy for him and to our god for he will multiply to him his abundant pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts Neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. So he's basically telling you how you can get his words, how you can get his thoughts, turning away from your wicked ways and turn to God. If you get into the word of God and you keep hearing the word of God, you keep meditating on the word of God, you study to show yourself a workman, rightly dividing the truth, and then you will have his word and you will have his way. The amount of attention that you give to God, to the word, is what's going to come back to you in a good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over measure. If you pay God a little attention and no attention, then um, you won't really have a strong faith. Abraham was strong in faith and he considered not his own body dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. He was praising God, praising him in the morning, in the evening, in the good times, in the bad times when things didn't look like if um, God's promises were going to come to pass, when it didn't look like if he was going to get Isaac the promised son. But because he, he was praising him, that's how he was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Exactly like when Jesus healed the 10 lepers and one turned back because he says, go and show yourself to the priest and offer the um, gift or whatever it was, the more which Moses had commanded to the um, priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. And um, that one, he turned back to give thanks and he was giving glory to God. He was thanking him. He was worshiping, worshiping him. He was praising him with the fruits of his lips. He was grateful and God called that praise. So giving glory to God is giving him praise, acknowledging him for every good thing that is going on in your life. So that's how Abraham was strong in faith because he kept praising God. He was fully persuaded that what God had promised, he's able to perform. So every time you see a promise in the Bible and you read it, you must be fully, be like Abraham, be fully persuaded that what God has promised, he will perform. God cannot lie. 
he cannot fail. And he's beautiful for every situation. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we can get God's thoughts by meditating on the word day and night, by listening to the word, by going to Bible studies and listening to what the preacher or the teacher is telling you, by studying the word for yourself. Praise God. As I said, study to show yourself a workman rightly dividing the word of truth. This book of the law, he says in Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so you can observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then shall you make your way prosperous and then shall you deal wisely and have good success. So um, that's how we get God's ways and his thoughts by studying, meditating on the word of God, reading it, praying it praising it, thinking about it, telling someone else about it. So for us then, for as the rain and snow come down from the heavens and return not there again, but water the earth and make it bring forth and sprout, that it may give seed to the soul and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void without producing any effect, useless but it shall accomplish that which I please and purpose, and it shall prosper in the thing which I sent it. So we are um, talking about speaking the word. And God is saying through his prophet Isaiah that his word cannot return void. As I said before, heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will not fail. So we give God honor and we give God glory. We will just... Um, recap a little bit about what we um, looked on last week because last week we looked at the reward of excellence or the reward for excellence so for those of you who weren't here last week I'll just briefly recap we read from Daniel chapter 6 which showed that Daniel had an excellent spirit we also know that he was 10 times wiser than all of the other people so he, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were wiser, 10 times wiser than all the other people. We also learn from scripture that Daniel did not defile his body by eating the king's rich food. So he, he, he ate a lot of vegetables and fruits, lots of healthy um, eating was taking place. I'm not saying eating meat is unhealthy because I do eat meat. And the scripture says we should not forbid people from eating meat that's devilish to keep um telling people that they can't eat meat not because you don't eat meat it doesn't mean that you must not forbid you must forbid others from doing so and the scripture tells us that so in any case he ate lots of um vegetables and things like that but he had an excellent spirit and because of this king darius he wanted to promote him over the whole realm the people became jealous and they knew that um, they that Daniel, <laughs> he had an excellent spirit. He he was faultless. He he worked really well. If he was ten times wiser, so I suppose his work was probably ten times better than all of the other people. So so they were jealous, and they knew they couldn't find any fault or error in him. The only way they could find a fault or error in him was if they found it against his God. So they got together the satraps, the deputies, and all these people, they got together and they um, decided that we're going to trick the king into making a decree that um, if anyone should make a petition to any other god for 30 days, apart from to King Darius, then they should be cast into the den of lions. And the king foolishly, he quickly agreed and he signed a decree which could not be reversed or repealed and then we know the story <laughs> when daniel was um put in the den of lions the, the king he was exceedingly sad and he wished that he could deliver daniel the same way reuben wished he could deliver his brother joseph when they had put him in the pit because he wanted to deliver him back to his brothers back to his father alive because he said lay no hand on him you know he's our flesh and blood we, we can't hurt him but in his absence, they sold um, Joseph to some Ishmaelites and the Ishmaelites sold Joseph to Potiphar, who was an officer of Pharaoh. 
and Joseph, he, he was doing the right thing. And he too had the same excellent spirit that um, Daniel had. And because he was with God, God caused everything he did to succeed. So even though he was a slave, Joseph was a slave, but he was prosperous. So some of you, you're doing horrible jobs. You're being mistreated at work. Yeah, yeah, you're called to do a certain job and then they're telling you, uh, you can just go and do the cleaning, go and sweep the car park, mop the floor, do this, do that, things that you want to um, call to do. And they're treating you really bad. But remember, even though Joseph was a slave, he was prosperous because God was with him. And if you're born again, God is with you. And the more the people try to oppress the Hebrews, is the more they are uh, multiplied. And, and that's why the um, evil Pharaoh, he wanted all the um, male babies to be killed. Hence, when Moses was born, the parents saw that he was a proper child. <laughs> he was a fair child. He was exceedingly handsome. And he, he was really a good child. And then she put him in the um in the river Nile the, the river Nile in the basket and Pharaoh's daughter found him and then she um kind of you could say she adopted him and she became the son of Pharaoh's daughter and she looked after him and he was raised in that household and then the good thing about it God turned around what the enemy meant for harm by allowing his own mother to nurse him and to be paid to look after her own child. So whatever horrible hardships you're going through, I'm here to give you a word of encouragement. This is not in my notes. God is able to make all things work together for the good of them who love God, who are called according to his purpose. So it may look like if nothing good is ever gonna happen to you, but we serve the God of the turnaround and he can turn it around for you, just like what He turned, how he turned it around for, um, Joseph. So Joseph was able to deliver many nations. Let's go to Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28, not in my notes, but we want the Holy Spirit to have his way. I know they're talking about prayer in, in this chapter, but God can still turn things around for your good, even though you may not be praying. We are assured and know that God being a partner in their labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good too. And for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. So um, Joseph was doing the right things. He had um, dreams, two dreams, and he stole his own brothers, people who he could trust, and they hated him all the more for his dreams. His father made him the colorful coat and they put him in, in the pit. And they, uh, as I said, they sold him. And he, he was an off, he, um, Pharaoh, an officer of Pharaoh bought him, Potiphar, and he was working and he was doing well and everything prospered and succeeded in that man's house because of Joseph. And Potiphar saw that the Lord was with him, just like how King Darius saw that an excellent spirit was in Daniel and he wanted to promote him. It was that same excellent spirit, the same excellent spirit that came upon David when, when Samuel anointed him to be king. And an evil spirit came upon Saul. So uh, let's have a quick look at Genesis. I know we're kind of diverting from what I plan to um, speak on, but let the Holy Spirit have his way. Because Joseph was doing so many wonderful things and, and then he was being punished for doing good. Genesis chapter 39, comments in verse 1. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain and chief executioner of the royal guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had brought him down there. But the Lord was with Joseph, 
you know so whatever you're going through once the lord the wonderful lord the powerful lord the lord who never fails the lord who is the same yesterday today and forever the lord that he let thee the lord who is jehovah jireh our provider the one with whom all things are possible the one who never fails the one who is beautiful for every situation the one who i read about who upholds all things by the word of his power once he is with you everything is going to be okay you may be the poorest born again christian but because god is with you you are prosperous it is well praise god you you are better off than the um the best sinner who has all the money or who has so much money in the world because at, this is a point in time where people have money and they can't even go out and spend it and and have fun so um the, it's the blessing of the lord that make it be rich and add it no sorrow it's not really the abundance of finances and things that you have true joy comes from god but jo but the lord was with joseph and though a slave he was successful he was a successful and a prosperous man and he was in the house of his master the egyptian and his master saw that the lord was with him and that the lord made all that he did to flourish and succeed in his hand so you may have lost your job you have may not you may have lost a husband you may have lost a child you may have lost a house i'm not making lightly over these things but once the lord is with you you are prosper prospering there is light at the end of the tunnel god will bring you out so um so god is beautiful for every situation joseph um he was put in prison for, for doing the right thing he was looking after all of Potiphar's affairs Potiphar paid no attention to anything apart from the food that he ate I think that was the mistake he made he, ne he, he neglected his wife and then she had strained eyes praise the name of Jesus but we thank God for Joseph's excellent spirit even though she tried to seduce him and he said no and she grabbed the garment that he was wearing and she held it up and she said that this Hebrew guy he's coming to mock us you know, and how he tried to rape her and then she shouted to the top of her voice or whatever and then he fled. So it looked like if she had evidence, that was false evidence appearing real. She had his garment, but, but it was, wasn't the truth. And then she told Potiphar and Potiphar, um, he was so unfair. He, he didn't even ask Joseph anything. The text doesn't make any um, any mention of him interviewing joseph or anything and he put him in the prison but because god was with him everything he did prospered and succeeded because when when joseph left potiphar's house i can assure you the blessing left potiphar's house because everything was going well in that house when um when joseph was there he was kind of like the blesser but the blesser left well god of obviously god is the head blesser but when he left that prosperity, I can assure you, would have left Potiphar's house. And then he put him in the jail and the jail prospered. Everything was going well in the prison. Let's go back to Genesis. Because Joseph was in prison and, and he was looking after those prisoners and he, and he did a good job. And the baker and the butler, they both had dreams. And then they were distressed and it was so unusual for them to be so unhappy and so on. And so Joseph inquired why they had such a sour countenance. What's up? Because he's used to people being full of the joy of the Lord, in, with the joy of the Lord. Because in God's presence, there's the fullness of joy. And at God's presence, there are ple in his presence, their pleasures forevermore. And so he inquired what was going on. They told them the dreams. They told them the dreams that they had. And then he said to the um, butler, he will be restored. He will be able to work again. 
with Pharaoh. And when he's restored, don't forget me. But he forgot. The um, baker's um, interpretation for his dream was not great. And he, he ended up dying. So even though Joseph went through all these things, he still had a good attitude. He still worked well. And then Pharaoh, he got into, um, he had some dreams which troubled him. He dreamt about the seven cows. Seven cows were um, very fat and healthy and prosperous. And then there were seven more cows which were thin and blighted. And the thin blighted ones ate up the healthy ones. And Pharaoh was troubled and he wanted interpretation and no one could interpret, <laughs> interpret the dreams. And then, thank God, the butler, he finally remembered. But he remembered at that time and God allowed him to remember at that time because if he had remembered before, Joseph would have been delivered prematurely and things wouldn't have worked perfectly as how God had wanted them to work. So let's go to Genesis chapter 41. I haven't forgotten that we're talking about speaking, about speaking the word. So we will get back to that. Genesis chapter 41, verse 1. After two full years, Pharaoh dreamed that he stood by the river Nile. So that was a dream. And it was a dream from God. Many of you are having dreams and sometimes the dreams may come out exactly how you dream it. Sometimes it needs an interpretation or sometimes God is showing you something that is going to happen in the future. Or sometimes it could be a warning. So sometimes you can pray against it. And those of you who have been having nightmares, God has redeemed us from nightmares. So you, you can speak to that mountain. Remember, we're talking about speak the word. That's my topic for today. You can speak to those nightmares and command them to be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. Because God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. But sometimes God may show you something and it may be a warning that you may have to pray, pray into the future about to stop. Because God, he wouldn't do anything without revealing it to his uh, prophets. Even when he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he, he didn't hide it from his friend Abraham. So Abraham was able to intercede. And he interceded and he stopped up to, if he found 10 righteous men, if God wouldn't um, destroy it. And he stopped at 10. If he had gone on, probably even just the one, because Lot was a righteous man, probably God would not have destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So... Um, Let's continue. Genesis chapter 41, verse 2. And behold, there came up out of the river Nile seven well-favored cows, sleek and handsome and fat. And some of you are speaking to that sleek guy. He appears to be handsome. He always saying the right thing at the right time. But it's something in your spirit saying, you know, he appears to be too smooth. And sometimes if it's too good to be true, then it's not true. If you're having a check in the spirit, then you better um, stay away from him and seek God's face. Don't rush and get married to him and then regret. You know, my mom says fools rush in where wise men never venture. So take your time. If you're getting a check in the spirit and he's not the one, there'll be other people. God will send someone better for you. It's not rush. Yeah, it's not over with your biological clock. You don't have to rush. Wait on the Lord. God gave Abraham and Sarah children in their old age. You don't have to rush. All things are possible with God. All things are possible to them that believe. So, so don't rush. God can give you a child in your old age just because you're heading, you're over 30 and you haven't had a child, you're getting desperate. Stop the desperation. God will provide. So, and behold, Genesis chapter 41, verse 2. And behold, there came up out of the river Nile seven well-favored cows, sleek and handsome and fat, and they grazed in the reed grass in a marshy pasture. pasture. Praise God. And behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river Nile, ill-favored and gaunt and ugly, and stood by the fat cows on the brink of the river Nile. So this is contrasting. He saw these seven handsome cows. These are excellent. This is something we desire. Any farmer would desire those cows. And then he saw these ugly ones. They, they were gaunt. So they were very slim and bony, very unattractive, very unhealthy looking. 
verse 4, and the ill-favored gaunt and ugly cows ate up the seven fat favored, sorry, ate up the seven well-favored and fat cows. Then Pharaoh awoke. So this was like a nightmare. What is going on here? You know, I'm seeing these seven healthy cows. They're fat, they're well favored. Now we've seen these thin, blighted um, cows. They're gaunt, they're very unhealthy, they're very unattractive. And these are actually eating up these um, handsome, fat, sumptuous, beautiful cows. What, what is actually going on? So he woke up, he probably woke up in a jump and he was troubled in the spirit, praise God, so much that his sleep left him. It's just like King Darius' sleep left him after he had put um, Daniel in the den of lions. Praise God. So he woke. Actually, no, he, his sleep didn't, didn't leave him. That was Darius. Yes, yeah, so he slept again and he slept and dreamt the second time. And behold, seven ears of grain came out on one stalk, plump and good. And behold, after them, seven ears of grain sprouted, thin and blighted by the east wind. Verse 7. And the seven thin ears of grain devoured the seven plump and full ears, and Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So in the morning, his spirit was troubled. See, he was worried. What is actually going on? He was bothered in his spirit. It's just like some of you, you're doing things and you're troubled in your spirit. If God is troubling your spirit, you need to Take a step back. Refrain from doing it. Praise, praise the name of Jesus. Something's wrong. Somebody might be have offered you, oh, um, you can buy this house. It's got four bedrooms. It's in a lovely area and things like that. But you're having a check in your spirit. Or they're offering you this Rolls Royce for a cheap price or whatever it is. But you don't have peace. Wait on the Lord. God is probably telling you not to buy it. Don't rush. I remember one time I... Um, had a car, I was happy with my car, I didn't even want another car. A friend of ours spoke me into buying it, oh, just buy it, you know, you know, because he was a salesman. And he just tricked me into getting a rubbish car. You know, so if your spirit is telling you not to do it, don't do it. But thank God he rectified it later. But, you know, because I, I didn't even, even have all the money. He says, oh, just write a few um, post data checks, he won't cash them. Did he keep his word? <laughs> no, he didn't. He cashed it and I ended up being in the red and I was so upset, you know, because I, I think I even had money in another account that I could have paid it, but I didn't want that car. He says, oh yeah, it's going to be okay. And, and the car was a nightmare. So um, thank God he put it right and I ended up getting a better car from him eventually. But if I'd listened to the Lord, I could have um, saved myself from so much trouble. So if you're having a check in your spirit about doing anything, don't do it. So um, Pharaoh, he was troubled in his spirit. And he sent and called for all the magicians and all the wise men of Egypt. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but not one could interpret them to him. Then the chief butler said to Pharaoh, I remember my faults today. So he, God had caused him not to remember before when um, Joseph had told him after he interpreted his dream, remember me and tell, tell Pharaoh about me, how I'd interpreted your dream that you would be restored. And he was restored to um, Pharaoh as his butler. So if he had remembered before, Joseph wouldn't have been able to do the perfect will for God's life. So God made him remember at the right time, even though Joseph suffered in the process, but he was suffering in the process so he could deliver many people. When, when Pharaoh was angry with his servant and put me in custody in the captain of God's house, both me and the baker, we dreamed a dream in the same night. He and I dr dreamed each of us according to the significance of the importance of his dream verse 12 genesis chapter 40 verse 12 for those of you who are now joining thank you very much and there was there with us a young man a hebrew servant to the captain of the guard and chief executioner and we told him our dreams and he interpreted and he interpreted them to us <coughs> excuse me each man according to the significance of his dream. 
verse 13, and ha as he interpreted it to us, so it came to pass. And I was restored to my office as the chief butler, and the baker was hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and brought him hastily out of the dungeon. But Joseph first shaved himself, changed his clothes, and made himself presentable. Then he came into Pharaoh's presence. So in the end, what happened, Joseph, um, he said the Lord will give the interpretation. He, he didn't take the credit. God gave him the interpretation of the dreams. And then he was able to, because Egypt did not have to suffer. They had the seven years of plentiful where there was abundance of food. And then when they had the seven years of famine and hardship, they had already set aside food and supplies and everything. So when the seven years of hardship, they were well provided for. And that's what happens when we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We will always be well provided for. And Joseph, as I said, he didn't take any credit. He said, the Lord gives the interpretations for the dreams. And so when God allows us to do things, like he says, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And when you lay hands and they recover, you don't go around saying it's your might, it's your power. Because it's not by might, it's not by power, it's but my, by my spirit, says the Lord. So we're going to get into the word for today. Speak the word. So uh, I said in Genesis... Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Because when, when God created the world, he spoke. He spoke things into existence. Also, we find in Luke chapter 4, when the devil spoke to Jesus, Jesus spoke back to him. Many of you, you're having your head filled with lies, with nonsense, because you're listening to the devil more than you're listening to the word. You know, you're listening to him more than you're listening to God. We're supposed to know God's voice clearer. Then the voice of the devil, we shouldn't even be able to really recognize his voice because the Bible says in John 10, my sheep hear my voice, John 10, 27, and they know me and they follow me. And then he goes on further on to say, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish and no man shall pluck them out of my hands. And he also says in John that a voice of a stranger, they will not follow. So you can't be plugged into the voice of the stranger morning, noon and night. And then in a time of trouble, you expect the word of God to come out. If you put the word in, word will come out. But if you put rubbish in, rubbish out. I remember I was doing Spanish in school and the teacher would be saying she might say something. And then I, I would like make a joke and just say something back. But it wasn't like, like the correct word. So she would say to me, if you talk bunk, you will write bunk. So if you don't have the right word sewn into your heart and you have rubbish sewn in, that's what's going to come out. If you panic and that's all you worry and you're in fear, in a time of trouble, that's what's going to come out. That's why you need to take the time to hide the word in your heart and not sin against God. Because that, that's what David did. He said, Psalm 119 verse 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. So he had the word in his heart, so it kept coming out. And you keep filling up over and over. It's a process that you keep doing it. So Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God prepared, formed, fashioned, and created the heavens and the earth. So this says God. It wasn't a big bang that created the world. I can't just bang two things together and I have a world. That, that's nonsense. It would create chaos. If, if I just got a hammer and I started banging the house and things like that, I might knock out some floorboards. I might knock out a glass window or something. So it, it was God that created the world, not a big bang. Because people are still making big bangs today and why aren't more worlds being created then? Verse two. The earth was without form and an empty waste, and darkness was upon the face of the very deep. The Spirit of God was moving over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. You see what happened? He wasn't doing anything without saying, isn't it? He said, let there be light, then the light came. Verse 4, and God saw the light was good, suitable, pleasant, and he approved it. And God separated the light from darkness. But he spoke before all these things happened. Verse 5. And God, and God called the light day 
a darkness he called night. So I'm not going to continue reading too much of that. But you, you would see that God would say something. If let's go to verse 10. And God called the dry land earth. So he called, he said something, he spoke words. We have to speak words because like you may have a, um, a credit card bill come in and it's saying that you owe 10,000 pounds. And if, if you don't pay it by such and such a date, this is going to happen. That is going to happen. Or someone might have had an eviction notice. If you don't pay this rent by tomorrow, you're out. So those things are speaking to you. So you need to speak back. Abraham, he spoke his faith. He called things which be not as though they were. And where did he learn to do that? He learned it from God because God called things which be not as though they were. Because in the beginning, it wasn't the world. The world, he spoke it into existence. And since the servant is not greater than his Lord, we need to do the same thing. Abraham saw what God did. He called him a father of many nations. His, um, his seed would be more than the, the sands of the shores and the stars of the sky. And if he could count the sands on the shore and the stars of the sky, so shall his descendants be. And we are Abraham's descendants today. Abraham believed and, and he spoke because um, God changed his name. It was Abram and God changed it to Abraham, which means father of many nations. So every time people were calling him Abraham, father of many nations, father of many nations, he was remembering and he had to get out of his father's tent because God says, go to a place that I will show you away from your father, away from your kin folks and so on. And he got away. He was when he was in the tent, he was limited because all he could do, he could look up in the tent and he can see the top of the tent. Whereas if we're in our house, I can look up, I can see the ceiling, but I can't see the stars from through my ceiling unless you have like a glass roof. That's the only way you're going to see the stars. So Abraham had to get out of his tent so he wouldn't limit God. So we give God honor and glory. And Abraham, he called things which be not as though they were. Hence, he, he became a friend of God. He believed God. So you must believe God. You have to call things which be not as though they were. So the Lord might be saying you're going to be evicted tomorrow. And you can say, you know, the psalmist said in Psalm, I think it's, he says, any case, I've been young and I've been old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. So they may say they're going to put you out. But you're, you're a child of God. You're born again. God said he will never see his righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. So you speak what God says. You speak Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd to feed, guide, and shield me. I shall not lack. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. So you, you living on the road, eating out of a garbage bin, that, that's not a part of God's plans. He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So you have to speak the word. Like Abraham, he spoke the word. He meditated on the word. There was even a time when um, Joshua, he, he just, um, they were having a problem and he, he wanted the, um, the sun to stay still or whatever. Whatever it was that he spoke, I may not be remembering properly, but he spoke. So you have to speak whatever it is you want. Don't say what you have is if it's undesirable. If your bills are not paying, every time you go into your purse and say, I don't have no money or my children's shoes are worn out, you say, but my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You can read Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 1 to 14. You can say, I'm blessed in the city, I'm blessed in the field, I'm blessed in my coming in, I'm blessed in, in my going out. I'm an overcomer, I'm the head always, I have all sufficiency for all things, I do abound to all good works. And you keep saying that and after a while it will come to pass. Speak your faith. Hallelujah. Jesus spoke he spoke in um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 10. And then he spoke in uh, verse 12. He also spoke. Well, he, 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 he spoke many, many other times. And he even spoke man into existence and everything. And he approved of his entire creation. So we need to speak. The centurion, he spoke his faith. He had a servant. And the servant was uh, at the point of death. 
and, and then he sent some elders to go to um, get Jesus and tell him to come to my house. And then he says, you know what? I'm a man of authority. I speak to this person. I tell them to do this. <coughs> Excuse me. I tell them to do that and they do it. And he said, don't bother to come to my house. Just speak a word. <coughs> Pardon me. And Jesus spoke the word and his servant was made whole or healed. He was healed in the self same hour. Let's go quickly to Luke chapter seven, because I know the topic for today is speak the word. Luke chapter seven. And we have so many examples in the Bible. We have blind Bartimaeus. I don't know if we're going to have time to even get to blind Bartimaeus today because he spoke. He wanted to be healed and the people told him to shut up. And the more they told him to shut up, the more he kept crying out. And then Jesus said, bring him. And he was able to receive his sight. He even threw off his beggar's garment. He had so much fight in God that God would deliver him. <coughs> Excuse me. Because beggars, they had to wear a garment so that people could know that they were an official beggar, not a fraudster. So he knew that he was going to see. So he threw that away. That was his fate. And, and God, um, he pleased God and Jesus healed him. So Luke chapter seven, comments in verse one. After Jesus had finished all he had to say in the hearing of the people on the mountain, he entered Capernaum. So I want you to notice the word finished. He doesn't do things halfway and stop. So whatever God has called you to do, I want you to go all the way. If God told you to write a book, I don't want you to just give up now. Keep going, keep writing. If God called you to be a Sunday school teacher and he didn't tell you to stop teaching the children, keep teaching them coronavirus or no coronavirus. Someone had to teach you the word, otherwise you wouldn't have been saved. So keep doing what the Lord has told you to do because he, he didn't stop until he finished. Now, verse 2, Luke 7, verse 2. Now a centurion had a bond servant who was held in honor and highly valued by him, who was sick and at the point of death. I want you to know that you're highly valued by God. You are loved by God. He has a wonderful plan for your life. And the plan does not include sickness, disease, fear running from the devil because he said submit yourselves therefore to god you can find that in james 4 7 resist the devil and he will flee from you so when the devil tells you you're going to die and you're not going to live and declare the works of the lord you resist him you don't assist him by repeating those words and telling it to everybody that you see every time you get on the phone that you've had this bad diagnosis you resist him and you say i will live and not die and declare the works of the lord and when you keep saying the word of god you are assisting god and you are resisting the devil. Some people are assisting the devil instead of assisting God. And uh, life and death is in the power of the tongue. So we need to use our tongues wisely. So hold your place in Luke 7. Go to Proverbs 18, 21. Because life and death is in the power of the tongue. After Psalms is Proverbs. Proverbs 18, verse 21. Praise the name of Jesus. Death and life. So every time someone is speaking, they're either speaking to you, death or life. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. This little pink thing that we have here, it can cause so much trouble, but it can bring joy and peace as well. And they who indulge in it shall eat the fruit of it for death or life. So don't, don't choose death. He said in Deuteronomy 30, 19, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life that you and your descendants or your seed may live. Choose life. Abraham chose life. You choose life. The, the centurion, he chose life for his servant. So you speak life. Go to Matthew 12, 37 before we return to Luke 7. Matthew 12, 37. Let everything be established out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Praise God. We give God honor and we give God glory. Matthew 12, 37. Oh, I was in Matthew 13. No wonder I wasn't seeing, <laughs> seeing the verse that I was looking for. 
for by your words you will be justified and acquitted and by your words you will be condemned and sentenced and i want you to notice we know that god is a very um loving and forgiving god and we thank god for that but once we say a word it cannot be unspoken so we need to ask god to tame our tongues help us to say the right thing don't say things against yourself the enemy is against you there's lots of people against you but you don't be an enemy to yourself use your mouth in the way that you want your life to go if you want to live and not die and declare the works of the lord say i will live and not die and declare the works of the lord if you want god to supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by christ you say but my god shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by christ or you can take it a further step and say thank you god for supplying all my needs according to your riches and glory by christ jesus thank you god i shall not lack thank you god no good thing will you withhold from those who walk uprightly i'm your child thank you for not withholding any good thing from me thank you for helping me to walk uprightly so we're back to the centurion in um luke chapter 7 as we begin to close to conclude luke 7 verse 2 now a centurion had a bond servant who was held in honor and highly valued by him so you are highly valued by god you are loved and you are accepted in the beloved if you're born again and even if you're not born again, you're still highly valued by God. He loves you and he wants to save you. He's a wonderful savior and he's a wonderful redeemer. So this centurion servant who was sick and at the point of death. And when the centurion heard of Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, requesting him to come and make his bond servant well. So he sent these servants to go and make so that Jesus could come and make his bond servant well. Verse four, and when they reached Jesus, they begged him earnestly saying, he is worthy that you should do this for him. So they were testifying about the goodness of this, this servant. He was a faithful servant. He served his master well. Let's see what they're saying in verse five. For he loves our nations, our nation, and he built us our synagogue at his own expense. Wouldn't that be wonderful for us to build a whole synagogue at our own expense? That would be lovely to get to that point. And Jesus went with them but when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent some friends to him saying, see, you see this saying, you got to speak. Lord, do not trouble yourself for I am not sufficiently worthy to have you come under my roof. Neither did I consider myself worthy to come to you. So he didn't feel that he was worthy to come directly to him. That's why he sent friends and then his servants. And then after he says, don't, don't even bother to come. See, see, he says, this is what, what he does. For I am a man daily subject to authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go. And he goes. And to another, come, come. You know, Jesus is saying, come on to me, all you who are laden and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for my burden is light and my yoke is easy. So, um, so he says, he says to somebody, come and he comes. And to my bond servant, do this, and he does it. So he knew the power of words. Verse 9. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him. He marveled at this man's faith. You know, I only hear about Jesus marveling, well, God marveling two times in the Bible. One time was because of the people's unbelief, but this was because of the, um, his faith, the centurion's faith. He had such wonderful faith. It's nice when God will say, it's wonderful, great is your faith. Like he said to that sy siphonarian woman who wanted her daughter to be healed. And she was saying, even the dogs eat the crumbs, even though Jesus called her a dog. She wasn't offended. She said what she wanted to happen and, and God made it come to pass. So uh, let's go. Now, when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him and he turned and said to the crowd that followed him, I tell you, not even in all Israel, Israel, there's all his people, you know, the chosen people. Have I found such great faith as this? So this was no one called great faith. And when the messengers who had been sent returned to the house, they found the bond servant who had been ill quite well again. So that, that's, that's wonderful. So he said he valued God's word above anything. He said, if you just speak the word, she shall be, um, well, he, I mean, the servant shall be healed. And he was made whole in the self same hour, or he was healed in the self same hour. We had 
the woman with the issue of blood in Mark chapter 5. She kept saying, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be whole. She decided how she was going to receive her healing and she decided when it was going to happen. But faith without works is dead. So she put her faith into action. She set out. She did exactly what she did. She touched the hem of Jesus' garment. He felt virtue had gone out of him. And then he said, who touched the garment and so on? And we know the story anyway. And he, uh, he says her faith had made her whole. So we thank God for that. We also have Jairus. He said, if you'll come to my house, you know, and lay, because his, his, his daughter was at the point of death. So he said, if you come to my house and lay your hands on my child, she shall be healed. So let's go to Mark 5 quickly. Hopefully we'll get to blind Bartimaeus because he spoke as well. We had two blind men as well in the Bible as well. They spoke. But Mark chapter 5 quickly. We have so much word, but there's never enough time. The word of God is inexhaustible. When you think you know it all, that means there's so much more to know. We can never know it all. Not in this lifetime. I can learn from you. You can learn from me. So I can receive correction from the smallest child. I don't mind who is coming from. God can use Whichever instrument or whoever he wants to use, if he used a donkey to correct a prophet, to speak to that prophet, God can um, use whoever or whatever he chooses to use. Right. Mark chapter 5, comments in verse 21. And when Jesus recrossed in the boat to the other side, a great throng gathered about him, and he was at the lake shore. Then one of the rulers of the synagogue came up. Jairus by name and seeing him he prostrated himself at his feet so he basically was lying prostrated at Jesus's feet in homage in worship and begged him earnestly saying my little daughter is at the point of death come and lay your hands on her so that she may be healed and live he spoke words faith filled words he said what he wanted he said come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and live and he received his miracle so you will not receive your miracle if you just have your mouth tightly shut especially when the devil is bombarding your brain with lies telling you oh all your children are going to be on drugs oh the father was an alcoholic all your grandchildren they're going to be the same they're all drug users they're all hopeless no christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law there um Blessing of the Lord make it be rich and God adds no sorrow with it. So just because it happened in the past, it does not mean it's going to happen in the future. So I myself have to work on words. You know, I can't just keep saying every time I try to find somewhere I get lost because you have what you say. We read life and death is in the power of the town. Proverbs 18, 21. So Jairus spoke his faith. So when we saw, we spoke about the woman with the issue of blood and so on. So let's skip down some verses. So after Jesus had dealt with the woman with the issue of blood and, and healed her, but she doesn't have the issue of blood now because she's healed. Then this is what happened now. So while he was speaking, Mark 5 verse 35, while he was still speaking, there came some from the ruler's house and said to Jairus, your daughter has died. Why bother and distress the teacher any further? So those were negative words. They needed to be negated. So let's go to verse 36, overhearing but ignoring. So Jesus didn't, he didn't agree because it's where two shall agree on as touching anything it shall come to pass, you know, because there's a power in agreement. One can put a thousand to flight, two, ten thousand. But Jesus strongly disagreed. So he overheard it and he ignored those words. He didn't repeat it. So he didn't give it any power. He didn't give it any attention. So, but ignoring what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be seized with alarm and struck with fear. Only keep on believing. So he told him, get rid of the fear. You know, don't, don't, don't be afraid. This report, what they're saying is not going to happen. And he permitted no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John. 
and the brother of James. When they arrived at the house of the ruler of the synagogue, he looked carefully and with understanding at the tumult and the people weeping and wailing loudly. So they used to pay professional mourners in those days to go and mourn. So these people were already there. Oh, she's dead. And I can imagine all the crying and everything with the fake tears because if there were, there were professional mourners, only the genuine people probably would have been really crying from the heart, genuinely meaning it. Verse 40, and they laughed and jeered at him. You know, they're laughing at the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he put them all out. So some of you hanging out with too many um, deadbeat people, you know, people who were saying, oh, you'll never make it. You, you will never have enough. You, you'll never be a preacher. You, your book will never sell. You, you will never do well. And because you're hanging out with those kind of people, they're just killing your dreams. It's the same thing like Joseph, he had his dreams and his brothers were dream killers. So sometimes you got to get away from them. So um, Jesus sent them away, right? So they jeered at him and he put them out. And taking the child's father and mother and those who were with him, he went in where the little girl was lying. So he took people who loved this girl, who cared about this child and got rid of all the doubters, all the unbelievers, because fear is contagious. And God did not give us the spirit of fear, so we need to get rid of the spirit. Uh, to get rid of the spirit of fear, He's not giving us the spirit of bondage again to fear, but He's given us the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, "Abba, Father." So, gripping her firmly by the hand, He said to her, "Talutakuma," which translated is, "Little girl, I say to you, arise from the sleep of death." So, to get her to arise from the sleep of death, He spoke words. So, we have to speak words. Speak the word of God. The devil spoke to Jesus. Jesus always spoke back. You can find that in Luke chapter 4. And instantly the girl got up and started walking around, for she was 12 years old, and they were utterly astonished and overcome with amazement. But they, they should have been expecting the miracle. People had been with Jesus for a long time. Disciples saw Jesus doing miracle after miracle. That's what they should have been expecting. Miracles should have been the norm. That's what should be happening with believers. Signs follow believers. Wherever we go in, there should be miracles. There should be healing. The lame should walk. The blind should see. <laughs> the, the, the deaf should hear. Even the dead should be raised up. The unsaved should be saved. Because he says signs follow believers. So we have to believe God and doubt the doubts. If it's something bad, I doubt it. If it's something that does not line up with the word of God, doubt it. Verse 43, and he strictly commanded and warned them that no one should know this. And he expressly told them to give her something to eat. Right. Let's go and have a look at blind Bartimaeus. Praise the name of Jesus. Mark chapter 10, as we conclude or begin to conclude. Mark chapter 10, starting from verse 46. Mark 10, commencing verse 46. Then they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, saying, Jesus, son of David, have pity and mercy on me now. So he started to shout, you know, he didn't speak in a whisper. He saw his chance. This was, he heard about Jesus. He heard how Jesus had healed the woman with the issue of blood. He heard probably about how Jesus had healed the man who hadn't seen. He, he was born blind and it wasn't because of his sin or his parents' sin. He heard about the man who was at the poolside, you know, for 38 long, hard years and, and he, could, he couldn't walk or anything. He heard how Jesus healed him. See, he heard about Jesus' reputation of healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, raising the dead. He heard about his reputation. It was so good. He heard about his reputation of interrupting funerals. Even in Luke chapter um, 7, I think it was, the widow, she, she had her, um, her only son and the son had died and, and she was weeping and Jesus said, don't weep. Praise God. And, and um, Jesus raised the son up from the dead. So he'd heard about Jesus, how he raised Lazarus from the dead. 
So he, he knew about his reputation and he knew it was his time to receive his miracle. So he spoke, his voice was bellowing like a loudspeaker and the people were not happy because sometimes you're praising God and you go to church and you're serving the Lord with gladness and the devil will tell you to shut up. Yet God says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. So you keep on praying, you keep on praising, you keep on standing. Don't let the devil shut your praise up just because you're having tribulations, you're having trials, you're having a, um, a hard time. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. And we must be the same regardless of what we're going through. We serve the Lord just like Paul and Silas. They sang praises even though they were in prison. And they prayed and they carried on as normal. Just like how Daniel, when the king commanded him that no one should make a, a petition to 30 days to any other gods. He didn't close his windows. He had his windows wide open with his face towards Jerusalem. And he prayed to his God three times a day as he usually did. So don't stop your praying. Don't stop your praising. In fact, in, in those times, you need to increase it. So blind Bartimaeus, he saw it was his time to receive his miracle and he spoke he opened his mouth and he shouted and when they heard this is verse 47 mark chapter 10 verse 47 and when he heard that it was jesus of nazareth he began to shout saying jesus son of david have pity and mercy on me now and many severely censored and reproved him, telling him to keep still. But he kept on shouting out all the more, You son of David, have pity and mercy on me now. So he repeated it again. So he was strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and his faith was rising up. He was not going to be silenced by the enemy. This gospel must not be silenced by the enemy. This gospel will be preached throughout the world before the end comes. So keep on preaching. Whatever God put on your heart to do, keep on doing. Keep on standing on the word. Don't cast away your confidence. Help is at hand. God is a present help in a time of trouble. And yet though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. God is with us. He will bring you out. He is more powerful than your problem. He is more powerful than any government. He is more powerful than any doctor, any nurse, than all of us put together. And he will bring you out. No evil will befall you. Neither shall any play come now your dwelling. Stand on the word of God. Believe the prophet, so shall you prosper. Believe the Lord, you will be established. And throwing off his outer garment, he leapt up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? So he had to speak again. If he kept his mouth shut, he wouldn't have received his miracle. And if he didn't have the tenacity to push through the people, the people were saying, shut up. But he ignored them and he continued doing what he needed to do. And the blind man said to him, Master, let me receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has healed you. And at once he received his sight and, uh, and accompanied Jesus on the road. Many people are receiving their miracles, but they're making the mistake. They're not continuing to follow God. So be a grateful person. Receive your miracles. Speak your faith. Continue to serve God. This is our last scripture now. There was another blind man. Go to Luke 18. We're going to conclude this time. There's many more where people spoke, but we're not going to go through any more after Luke 18. Luke 18 verses 35 to 43. And we're going to conclude there. Luke 18. The word is so sweet. It is so powerful. It's inexhaustible. There's so much that we can learn <coughs> from the scriptures. None of us have it all. Excuse me. As he was near to Jericho, it occurred that a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging and hearing a crowd going by, he asked what, is, what it meant. They told him Jesus of Nazareth is passing by and he shouted saying, Jesus, son of David, take pity and have mercy on me. But those who were in front reproved him, telling him to keep quiet and he screamed and screamed so much the more. Son of David, take pity and have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and ordered that he be led to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight, your faith, your trust and confidence that spring from your faith in God has healed you. And instantly he received his sight and began to follow Jesus, recognizing, praising, honoring God. And all people, when they saw it, praised God. So if you want to receive your miracle, you can't keep your mouth shut. You open it loud and, and you speak and you say what you, what you want. Don't, don't say the doctor's report. Don't keep repeating it to a million people. If you have to tell a few people, you just say what it is. 
but don't keep rehearsing it over and over because you're going to have faith for that sickness instead of having faith in God. So thank you again for 